So I remind you about the bracket, of course. Some things I may just skip over very quickly. But let's not skip over this. Here is the Kravana category. Um, all the states of the bracket, one arrow going from uh, a given state to another state if it changes from an A smoothing to a B smoothing, forming a cube. And our question is, how can you obtain topological information from this category? And we know one way to do it, which is to just forget that it's a category and take the contribution from each object in this category as the product of the labels times D to the number of loops and, um, and adjust B to be A inverse and D accordingly, and we get the bracket polynomial invariant. But Kovanov's ambition back in around 1998-1999 was to do better, and he did. Um, so in order to talk about this, and you may have seen um, expositions of ele elementary expositions of Kovanov homology, it's very interesting to think about this construction. And so I want to talk about it from the beginning, of course, not saying everything. So one thing we're going to do is follow Kravanov and rewrite the bracket. So we rewrite it as involving a variable Q so that the value of the loop is Q plus Q inverse. And the value of a loop next to a bit of knot diagram is Q plus Q inverse times that. And the bracket itself evaluates with a minus Q on the B smoothing and a one on the A smoothing. Now, this is not invariant under Reitermeister moves, and I probably have a slide showing how it changes, but there is, of course, a normalization factor that takes you directly over to the Jones polynomial. Uh, the advantage of this is algebraic and um, combinatorial. It's really quite convenient that the value of the loop should be Q plus Q inverse rather than having minus signs in it. And all the problems about minus signs are relegated to that B smoothing. So now we're going to use an idea due to Olyek Vero called enhanced states. And the simplest example of enhanced states is to assign to a circle two signs, a plus sign and a minus sign. So the circle, a bare circle, becomes a sum of two circles. And the evaluation of it is Q for the one with the plus sign and Q inverse for the one with the minus sign. And that, of course, accords with our evaluation of the circle. Every state, then, in a picture like this is going to have plus or minus signs on it as well. And that means that instead of having eight states, we have quite a number. Let's see how many we have. The very first state at the top is going to have four because you have four choices for plus and minus. And then the single loops have two. So four and two is six and two is eight and two is 10. And then you're gonna have four and four and four. So that's 12 more making 22. And then you have three things here. So that's eight more, that's 30. So they're gonna be 30 enhanced states instead of only eight. Many more states and we will make use of them. Um, what happens is that you have, you have push the binomial theorem into the combinatorics. If you evaluate two loops, you would get Q plus Q inverse squared. Well, what happens if you expand in terms of the enhanced states? Well, then you have four plus and minus combinations, and they are Q squared and one for Q, Q inverse, and one for Q, Q inverse, and Q to the minus two, and you get Q plus Q inverse squared. It's quite easy to see that you push the binomial theorem over into the combinatorics. Then it turns out that it's going to be very convenient, we'll see why shortly, to call the minus one x and the plus one y. There's going to be an algebra here, and x is a good variable, and one is the identity in the algebra, you'll see. Um, now, what happens to the bracket when we use this formulation? Well, every state, every enhanced state, is going to contribute a power of Q. And the, what power of Q? Q to the J of S, what could J of S be? The number of B smoothings, of course. That's what it is. Um, but not all. 
because some of the loops contribute a Q and some of the loops contribute a Q inverse. So the J isn't just the number of B smoothings, it's the number of B smoothings plus the number of plus loops minus the number of minus loops. And I call that part lambda of S. And NB of S is the number of B smoothings. So we have a nice formula for the bracket in terms of a sum of monomials. But I'm going to think of it a little differently in the direction of making this into homology. I'm going to say, well, there are going to be a certain number of states that have the same I, the power of minus one, and the same J, the power of Q. Let's collect them all together into one collection and make a module out of them. So Cij is a module generated by the states whose I is I and whose J is J. And that means that in those states, there will be I B smoothings and the J, which is the number of B smoothings plus the number of minuses minus plus the number of pluses minus the number of minuses is equal to that particular value J. We have a module generated by the enhanced states with I equal to NB and J is above. And then you have the dimension of the module, that's just the number of states. And so we can write the bracket as a sum of minus one to the I, Q to the J, dimension is CIJ. And this is in the, as I say, this is in the direction of making a homology theory because what if, what if there were a differential which went from CIJ to CI plus 1J, leaving J fixed, but shifting I up by 1? We're going to see we can do that. But what if? Then you could rewrite the sum at the top of this slide as the sum of over J, Q to the J, times the sum over I minus 1 to the I, dimension CIJ. I hope I put that in the next slide. I didn't. I put it in the next slide, so we'll skip one. You see, I rewrote it. And here's the sum on I minus 1 to the I, dimension of CIJ. But that is the Euler characteristic of that complex. There is one complex for the number J. Every J has a complex. The I's run, and those are the ones that go up in the, under the differential. Remember, I said that I would assume that there's a differential which takes I to I plus 1, leaves J alone. We'll see how to construct it. But that would be the Euler characteristic of that complex. And then if there was a homology, if I had a differential, then by homological algebra, the Euler characteristic of the homology, the alternating sum of its dimensions, would be equal to the Euler characteristic of its underlying chain complex. And so we would get a formula for the bracket that is the sum of Q to the J times the Euler characteristics of these homologies. Well, those homologies are going to be the Kravanov homology. And the, so the Kravanov homology is a lot of homologies, one for each grading J. And the graded Euler characteristic is equal to the bracket. Now, the, the, a good way to think about the boundary, which is going to take A to a B, adding one more B, is to think of it as a little cobordism that starts in the A smoothing and ends in the B smoothing. We'll come back to that. Well, we'll come back to it immediately, but I'm showing you the algebra here. So the algebra uh, is going to be as follows. If you have two circles, like at the bottom of the slide, and you went from an A to a B smoothing, that's the A inverse, then the two circles would become one circle. And we're thinking of a module that's generated by the states. And so there would, that would be labeled circles. And so if you had a labeled circle, there should be a way of multiplying two labeled circles to get a new labeled circle. And on the other hand, if you had an A that split into two, then there would have to be a mapping from the module to the tensor product of the module with itself, because that's what's natural to do if you have multiple circles to take their tensor products. And then we would need a coproduct. And it turns out, as we're going to see, that the coproduct on the x should be x tensor x, and the coproduct on the 1 should be 1 tensor x plus x tensor 1. And the x should multiply by itself to give you zero. 
And we'll see why in a moment. So this is what I'm saying, that if you do that, and you take the boundary operators to be the sums of all of the different, maybe we go back to the Kovano complex now to point out what I'm saying. You see, from any given place, like up at the top, there are a number of arrows, and each one of those arrows corresponds to a module map of the kind that I'm talking about. For example, the left arrow at the top um, goes from two circles to one circle, so it's a multiplication. The, um, the arrow from the middle to the next one over goes from one circle to two, any of those arrows, and so those are co-multiplications, and the arrows at the next level are, multipli are um, sometimes one and sometimes the other. No, they're all co-multiplications, all the right. But the point is that any individual arrow is going to be a multiplication or a co-multiplication. But what we're going to do is we're going to sum over all of the arrows. And that means that we're going to take as the C1 module, the one with 1B, the direct sum of the modules corresponding to each of the states. So we're taking direct sums horizontally, taking the triplets and making them into one module, each triplet into one module, and we get a chain complex that way if we should tell you what the signs are in the boundaries, which we will. All right? So, I already said it here. That's a better slide. I was going back to explain it, but here it is explained again. So this collapsing along the horizontal lines gives us the chain complex where the indexing goes up, uh, but it's still a chain complex. It's not cohomology, really. Um, so we want to get a boundary map like this. It goes, that I goes up, J remains the same. And we know that means that the lambda has to go down because the J goes up. And remember, the J is the number of Bs, smoothings, plus lambda. So the lambda should go down, and the lambda is the number of plus loops minus the number of minus loops. And so we want that. And so we can get it. Look at this, it's very interesting. You just try to make it happen. If you had two pluses, and you asked how would they multiply, well, <coughs> the lambda is two locally. Um, and in order to get the lambda to go down, it would have to go down to one. So that circle must be labeled plus. If you had a plus and a minus, then the lambda is zero, and it has to go down to a minus one, so that circle has to be labeled minus. And, and if you had two minus signs, then the, the lambda would have to go down somehow to minus three, but it can't, so we call it zero. And now you see why I call x the minus and one the plus, because if you think of this as a multiplication, then the plus acts like a, a unit. It doesn't change anything. Plus times minus gives you minus. Plus times plus gives you plus. And on the other end, the minus times the minus is equal to zero, so x squared is zero. And there's our multiplication. And now what about the co-multiplication? Well, if you had an x, the lambda would be minus one. And you want to go to two of them, and you want to get to minus two. And there you are, x and x, one on each loop, and you're at minus two. So delta of x is x tensor x. And what about one? Well, one is, has lambda one, and we want to get to lambda zero. We want lambda to go down. So one and x, one goes up, x goes down, x is minus one. So that'll give you zero, and you can do it in two ways. You add them. Remember, we're in a module. And that means, and is more recognizably and easier to see, just to write down the algebra. Delta of one is one tensor x plus x tensor one. So we have made an algebra that would describe the boundary map. But we want to know that it really is compatible in the sense that if I were to start with two circles and the possibility of doing a boundary mapping on an A smoothing in one of them or doing the boundary mapping on an A smoothing between them, that it shouldn't matter in what order I did it. I want that to be the case. If we could go back to the category again for a moment. I want that to be the case because I want any one of the 
squares in this category. For example, at the very top, you can go left and down, or you can go down and left, and there's a square, a little rectangle in the category. I want all those rectangles to commute. Now, one reason I want them to commute is because if I do that, it's going to make it clear that the boundary of the boundary is equal to zero, at the very least, mod two. Because you will get two copies when you do boundary, boundary, you will get two copies of anybody, one coming from going around the square, the rectangle one way, and one going around the rectangle the other way. Another way of thinking about it, if you're thinking categorically, is you're looking to put a functor on this category so that all the commuting squares that would be commuting in the category will be commuting in the image. I won't go into saying it that way, but that's in back of this thought as well. So, so now back to the nitty gritty. Here's a little cobordism, and I'm going to use it to keep track. And the first time I'm going down, I'm multiplying. I'm using the A in the middle and going to a B. The two circles become one circle. And I'm labeling the top circles with one and doing a little algebra experiment. OK, so the, so the waistband here is one. And now I'm going to do a co-multiplication on the other A that's listed there. And the one goes to 1 tensor x plus x tensor 1. 1 on one circle, x on the other, and vice versa. Now, what happens if I take it in the other direction? In the other direction, the first thing I'm going to do is the co-multiplication on the left A, and then leaving the right tube all by itself identically going on down. And I had a 1 up there, so now in the middle, I'm going to get 1 tensor x plus x tensor 1, and then tensored with 1. You can see it over there on the right-hand part of the slide. And then we're going to multiply on the second two tensor factors. So that's 1 tensor x tensor 1, and you multiply x and 1, and you get x. And x tensor 1 tensor 1, and you multiply 1 and 1, and you get 1. And lo and behold, we get the same result. This is good. And it's really true that all the squares you can ever write will commute. All the rectangles commute. Um, and furthermore, if you're thinking in terms of cobordisms, then you see that the commuting corresponds to cobordisms that are homeomorphic. Look at this example, and you see that that's true. The cobordism that I drew, the bit of surface that I drew in between there and the other one, they're homeomorphic. You just move the, move the saddle points up and down, and you end up in the other picture, or you take the saddle points in the left picture and you move one up and the other down. And so what we're really seeing is that this algebra corresponds at the level of a one manifolds and two-dimensional cobordisms. This algebra is a topological quantum field theory. The cobordisms, the algebra is assigning the same thing to homeomorphic cobordisms. So there's a little bit of topological quantum field theory in the structure of the boundary of our complex that we're in the process of constructing. Oh, I see. I have another example. Um, how's our time running? Might as well do it. So in this case, I have, um, I have 1 times x, and I get x tensor x. And in the other case, I, it, it works. You can have fun doing these examples. I see I had a few more. It's fun to do those examples and see that this all works. Another thing that's worth understanding while we do this is that you would like to actually extend this algebra to make it into a TQFT, and that's important for certain aspects of the homology as well. So we should have mappings that correspond to going from algebra to ground ring and from ground ring to algebra. The one that goes from algebra to ground ring is called the co-unit. The one that goes from ground ring to algebra is called the unit. We'll take one to one. Yeah, and um, look at what happens when we have a bit of cobordism here with a 
with a minimum. Uh, a, and uh, you'll see why I want this. So I start with A, then I have delta of A, which is the sum of some products, uh, tensor products. And then I apply epsilon to the first one, tensored with the second one, and then I, I do the multiplication. And I get, I have to get A back. And if you take A equal to one and you work it out, you find that epsilon of one should be one and epsilon of X should be equal to, epsilon of one should be zero and epsilon of X should be one. It's a matter of doing the algebra and I don't want to force you into doing algebra here. But the interesting thing is then what happens to little surfaces? If you started with a sphere, for example, um, then you would have a one and then you see epsilon of one is zero. So the value of a sphere, a two sphere, would be zero. But on the other hand, if you had a torus, then you would go from one to one, and then you would have delta of one, which gives you the one tensor X and X tensor one in the middle, and then you would multiply and you'd get two X. And then you would epsilon that and you get two. So that says that the value of the torus is two. And then you'll find that all the higher genus surfaces vanish, but the value of a torus is two. So that's the way this works. That's a Frobenius algebra. And there are algebraic definitions of Frobenius algebras, but I won't go into them here. So here we are um, thinking about the complex again. And as I say, uh, it's important to think about it in terms of the structure of the cube. In back of any of these complexes is a structure of a cube, and the vertices are labeled with strings of A's and B's. Right? You started with A's on the left, and then you changed one A to a B. So you have BAA, ABA, AAB. And then you changed again, getting two B's, BBA, BAB, ABB, and then three B's. And in general, for a hypercube. Now, when you're taking a boundary, you want to know how to assign a sign. And I think I didn't include it in the slideshow, but I can tell you what you do. You go up to one of these at the level of the string of A's and B's. And you say to yourself, this litany, I'm changing this A to a B. How many A's are there preceding it? I will multiply it by minus one to the number of A's that precede it. So go all the way back to the left and you will see what that means. The first change of A to B, the one at the top, gets a, a sign plus. The next one gets a sign minus because there's one A preceding that A. And the next one gets a plus because there are two A's preceding that A. And so on down the line, but the number of A's and B's is changing down the line. That gives you the signs and gives you an integral complex. And then everything works. With the boundaries as we've described them, we have Kovano homology. I see there's a missing arrow at the bottom of my cube. Um, I wanted to say some remarks about uh, making categories, but in the interest of time, I will skip them. On the other hand, here's our category. So we can start with a cube category, and then we get the category of Kobanov corresponding to a given modern link, with objects being much more complicated than just strings of A's and D's. And um, and then we can think of this category, its maps, as being these cohortisms if we want to. And so if you want to think of the chain complex that we constructed, you can think of it. Or you can think of the category with its maps that are cohortisms. And let me go on because the next issues are better understood by going on rather than reading you this slide about drawers construction of a category. I'm going to remind you, however, that when you have chain complexes, then if you have a, hum if you have a mapping from the chain complex to another chain complex that changes the degree by one, and it has the property that boundary H plus H boundary is equal to the difference between two chain maps, that that is called a chain homotopy. And uh, if two maps are chain homotopic, 
then they induce the same map on homology. This is, uh, this is a generalization of the idea of a homotopy. And it corresponds exactly to the structure of a homotopy. And if we want to show that two complexes have the same homology, then we can do it by constructing a chain homotopy. Now let me see if I can get away with going to the next slide right, and then telling you about Dora's idea. Because here is what we have to compare. If we wish to compare Kovanov's category before simplifying by a Reitermeister move and after. In the after, the category is locally simple. It's just two parallel lines. But before, you have all these smoothings and you have four, four states locally. And you would like to be able to map between these two categories. At the categorical level, you don't know how to make a map because in the upward direction, you seem to be wanting to take one object below to two objects above, and you don't know how to do that. But at the chain complex level, you have the direct sum of these two as we have described it. So at the chain complex level, it's possible to go into the direct sum and back out of the direct sum. Drawer's idea is think categorically and cobordantly and take the direct sum nevertheless. So we can convert our category of cobordisms and maps to a category that looks like a chain complex but doesn't have the algebra or the algebra is in the background of our minds. So then you would have a direct sum here, and it's a formal direct sum. Then we want to figure out how to compare these two. And you can see what to do. If you go in the G1 direction going down, then you have the two parallel lines at the top, and they can go down identically. The circle can go down by taking a cobordism that makes it go away. And now you see why I want to think about all my algebra maps as cobordisms. So I take a little cobordism that makes the circle go away, and that's the G1 on the bottom line. What about F1? F1 will create a circle by doing a little cobordism, or it will just go identically up into the top. The part from the bottom to the top going identically means that we don't have to worry about the top part but we want to see a chain homotopy equivalence along the bottom line. And if we do that, we will understand why it happens that this homology theory that we're defining ends up being invariant under a second Reitermeister move. So we have to watch carefully here and see what these maps look like. The F1 map, the one going down, created a circle. The G1 killed off a circle. And if you compose F1 with G1, you get a little sphere in the middle and some surface, but the little sphere is zero. So that one is zero, F1 composed with G1. If you do F1 and come back to G1, that one's zero. If you do F2, if you do, um, I won't bother you with boundary compute commuting with one of these maps, but I'll go to the next one. Now we're along the bottom line, and we want to get a chain homotopy along the bottom line, a chain homotopy of this complex to itself under the mapping which goes G1 and then F1. So it maps it back to itself. We want to see its chain homotopic to the identity. That's the main bit in checking that things are chain homotopy equivalent. But along this bottom line, we need an H that goes backward. And we need another H that goes backward. And the simplest guess for going backward is give birth to a circle. And here, let that circle die. So we're going to do that. We're going to say H1 is let that circle die. And H2 is give birth to a circle. And then what about the boundary maps? Well, the boundary 2 map is melding and uh, is re-smoothing the A into the B. And so it's a tube getting re smoothed in there in the boundary two map. And the boundary one map is a, co is a co-multiplication 
and it gives birth to a, uh, a circle by sticking a tube out through a saddle point like that. So there are all the maps. And now we could write down what the situation would be like if it were a chain homotopy to the identity. I'm doing it mod 2. I'm not worrying about the signs. G1F1. There's the G1F1. Here's the identity map. And on the other hand, here's the H1 boundary, and here's the boundary H. And now, now maybe you should just believe me that I've composed them correctly, and look at what we have. We have that this sum should be equal to that sum, or the, or the sum of all of these should be equal to zero. And there ain't no reason in general why that should be true, but there's a pattern to it. And the pattern to it is that, I hope it's in the next slide. Yeah, the pattern to it is that you have four bits of surface here, one, two, three, four, see them? And then you have put tubes between one and two, three and four, one and four, and three and two. And the identity that you want is the tubings, one, two, minus two, three, plus three, four, minus one, four, should be equal to zero. If you took the moral that what you are really looking at is a cobordism theory that looks like homology, then you could say, all right, I don't know any algebra. All I know is cobordisms, but I'm going to mod out by this relation among the cobordisms. And then you would have something which was chain homotopy invariant, and it would work for the three move as well, and you would have a cobordism kind of homotopy theory for Kravana homology. Quite abstract, but very beautifully formulated just in terms of pictures, cobordism. Here's the four tube relation of drawer barnacon. All right? And if you think of it in one, two, three, four, it goes one, two, two, three, three, four, one, four. But in fact, what we're going to see is that the algebra that we discovered earlier satisfies the four tube relation. And the way to see that is to write out the four tube relation for two bits of surface near one another, where I think of four bits of surface which are connected. One and two are connected along a surface top, and three and four are connected along a surface bottom. And then I can tube from one to four, and I can tube from two to three, just in my picture at the top. And I can tube from one to two, and I can tube from three to four to three. Um, and I get two copies on the left. And so I could divide by two. And I get that a tube, a single tube between one surface higher than the other is equal to one half of a torus, a bit of torus, on the top and nothing on the bottom, or vice versa. And I'll lose a little blob for the torus. And it turns out that that blob can be the element x. I leave it to you to introspect why I can call the, the element x the blob, but it's it's because of the way we were evaluating a torus. So instead of the four tube relation, we have a tube relation that says that a tube can be cut and algebra labels the top and the bottom like that. And then you can see that the, the two things are equivalent to one another and we won't go over that. And you can even see that the coproduct is determined by this four tube relation. You can find the algebra from the four tube relation. But on the other hand, we can find out the algebra from it in a direct way. Um, and we can see that the algebra that we already had satisfies it. I'm going to go this route for a minute or two. Let's suppose we have the tube relation and let's find algebra from it. All right. So in order to do that, we have to write down what the tube relation means algebraically. Now you have to concentrate a little bit on my top slide. If you placed algebra alpha on the tube on the left, it's an identity. So it would go down alpha. On the other hand, if you, repla if you place alpha at the top of the left-hand one, then you get alpha times x. And then you get epsilon applied to it. And then you get the, co -un the unit applied. 
and you get epsilon of alpha x times 1. And on the other hand, if you do it in the other one, you get epsilon of alpha, and then you multiply by x. So the algebraic identity that this corresponds to is alpha equals epsilon of alpha x times 1 plus epsilon of alpha times x. And we don't know any algebra. So we're going to try to figure out what this tells us. So you see, we could put in x for alpha. And then this would become epsilon of x squared times 1 plus epsilon of x times x. And this is supposed to be equal to x. So this tells us that epsilon of x is 1, and epsilon of x squared should be 0. And then we try putting in x for putting in 1 for alpha. And then we get 1 equals epsilon of x times 1 plus epsilon of 1 times x. We already know that epsilon of x is 1, and so epsilon of 1 should be 0. And we're good. Now we try one more time. Um, we try x squared, and we get epsilon of x cubed plus epsilon of x squared. Now we already know epsilon of x squared is 0, so we get x squared equals some constant times 1, where that is equal to the epsilon of x cubed. We don't know what that is. So we get x squared as a constant. In our original algebra, x squared is 0. So if x squared is 0, it'll all work. But we are actually deriving a more general algebra. Um, and we can get the coproducts by fooling around. And I won't do that. But this is what you find by doing this method. You get, um, you get a, a more general Frobenius algebra that will still give you a, a homology theory uh, with epsilon of x equal to 1, epsilon of 1 is 0. Delta is before, but delta of x is uh, equal to x tensor x plus k times 1 tensor 1. And x squared is k. If we take k equal to 0, you have the one that we started with. So the one we started with satisfies the four tube relation, but so do these, all of these. And if you were to take k equal to 1, you get another algebra discovered by Yun Su Lee. And, um, that gives rise to a homology theory as well, and a very interesting one. And the two homology theories are related to one another. So that's uh, one way of thinking about the story of this subject, that the invariance, the topological invariance of these theories is really best seen by thinking the way Dror thinks about it, cobordism-wise. And then you can see in terms of the structure of the cobordisms why you get chain homotopy equivalences under Reitermeister moves. Uh, and you do, and these things work. Um, Lee's algebra looks like this, as I said, and it doesn't anymore respect the grading when you use it for boundary. You get, you get that the J grading changes under, under the Lee algebra, and that's a good thing. You can use that value of j to filter the chain complex for the Lie homology. And um, as a result of that, one can uh, get interrelationships between the Lie homology, which is easier to compute, it turns out, and the Kovana homology. And that leads to invariants that were discovered by Ross Musa. I'm not going to go into all the details of that. But I do want to point out to you, in case you're interested in some algebra exercises, that Lee's algebra can be rewritten into a very pretty form. You let R be 1 plus x over 2 and G be 1 minus x over 2. Think of it as red and green. And then the epsilons become simple and the R plus G is 1. And the R squared is R and the G squared is G and the R G is 0. And the coproducts are easy to understand. And the Lee homology turns out to be generated by cipher smoothing states, states where you smooth in an oriented way with appropriate labelings. And the labelings are like coloring, like coloring in graph theory, getting different colors. Because remember that RG is zero. So if you can label alternately with R and G, then the boundary will be zero and it will be a cycle. So Lie homology is not so complicated as Kovana homology. And then you, you, uh, you look at the relationship between Lie degrees and, and, and the Kovana degrees, and you find that you can get an invariant, Ross Moosen's invariant. And 
in the interest of time, I'm not even going to go into the definition, but you can look at it in my slides and you look at it elsewhere as well, of course. But one of the nice things about Rasmussen's invariant is that it has cobordism invariants associated with it. And he was able to give an elementary proof of Milner's conjecture about the genus in the foreball of Taurus Knox by using this. And I'm going to skip lightly across this, just telling you that there is that nice conjecture that the genus of a torus knot in the four ball is equal to a minus one times b minus one over two in the four ball. That's its genus in the three space, but it really works. It's the same as in the four ball. And this very interesting way of combining the comparison, doing the comparison between the Lee homology and the Kavanaugh homology allows one to conclude things like that. I'm just skipping the details here. Now we want to talk, we've got a few minutes left, and we want to talk about the Kavana homology for virtual links. And this, what I'm going to tell you about is relatively simpler than what I might have told you about a few months ago. This is our latest evolution of Monturov's original approach. The, the evolution occurs in through uh, collaborations with Heather Dye and Aaron Kastner and A.G. Ogasa and Scott Baldridge and Ben McCart. Um, but the original problem, uh, and the main, the main jump that we made recently was to realize that while it had been formulated originally using oriented link diagrams, and then there was a lot of complication that went into the train after assuming that they were oriented, we realized, oh, we could have stayed unoriented like we usually do and done it. And, and then it's simpler. So it is simpler now. And in fact, we're working on some programs that now seem to be computing it correctly. And so there will be tables and we're going to be able to make some progress with this homology. But the problem with doing virtual homology is that when you smooth, you might, get, you might go from one, one curve to one curve. And what are you going to do with that? And one of the simplest things to do with that is to call it zero, but then you run into another problem. You see, I might call it zero, and here's, a, here's one of my squares that I want to commute. And around the top, it's zero. And around the other two sides, it's a delta, it's a co-multiplication, and a multiplication. Um, and you see, if I started with one in the upper left, then I would get the multiplication of one tensor x plus x tensor one, which is two x. The same as the computation on the torus, right? And, um, and that says it's not commuting. On the other hand, if you were modulo two, it commutes. So in fact, we're done, mod two. We have Kramana homology for virtuals mod two, no problem. This is the only obstruction to justice. On the other hand, if we want to do it over the integers, and we do, what are we going to do? Well, it turns out that a very good solution, which is basically the silly idea, is to use local coefficients. And when you move an algebra element around, if you have to move it through a virtual crossing, you multiply the x by a minus 1, and you leave the 1 alone. And then you keep track of things. So let me show you it on an example, and you'll see how this works. I started with this one here, and I transport it over into the place where I want to do the co-multiplication. And then I get an x and a one and a one and an x, right? One tensor x and x tensor one. Um, but now I want to do a multiplication, so I have to transport these fellows over to the site where I do the multiplication. Um, this x just transports, no, it doesn't go through a virtual crossing, it ends up here. This one transports, but this x over here, the one with a little line attached to it, goes through a virtual crossing as it, as it travels up to the top and becomes a minus x. The result of that is that when you do the multiplication, you started, you transport the one tensor x plus x tensor one, and it transports to one tensor x plus minus x tensor one, and then when you multiply it all vanishes. A miracle. And the miracle really works. That miracle works. You simply 
keep track of these transports uh, and use a local coefficient system that way. You do it in the unoriented complex and you put in the signs that I told you about before. Remember those signs? You look at an A, you're working at this A, you count how many A's there are prior to that A and you take minus one to that. That gives you the signs in the complex. No Grossman algebra, nothing. Um, and this gives us uh, a definition of virtual Carvana homology that we're investigating and that we used uh, to get a Lee homology and a Rasmussen invariant for virtual knots before. Heather and I, Heather and I and Aaron did, um, but we used the more complicated definition. Um, now, um, there are other candidates. Um, Tubenauer has uh, a definition of integral Carvana homology, and there is the doubled Carvana homology of um, of, um, of William. Um, oh gosh, his name just went out of my mind. Sorry, um, Williams' uh, doubled Carvana homology, and um, there may be others as well. This is the one we're working with, um, and I wanted to talk about virtual knot cobordism, and we have just a few minutes left. Let's see, my watch says that we have. Five minutes left. Well, we'll probably steal a couple, but let's see what we can do. Um, so, to do virtual knot cobordism, we're going to allow saddle points and births and deaths. So, we're doing combinatorial knot cobordism of virtual knot diagrams. I am not here worrying about what kind of surfaces are embedded in four space or virtually embedded in four space. One can, one can. Um, so for example, here is the virtual stevedores knot, I call it, and I've oriented it in the second diagram and I'm gonna go through an oriented saddle point, and I do, okay? And I went through that oriented saddle point and now you see a consecutive sequence of virtual crossings, three of them. Start in the lower right and go along, one, two, and up on the top three. You can cut that out and replace it by the arc after detour move that I've indicated. Remember, you're allowed to do a detour move. You're allowed to do virtual moves, and you're allowed to do saddles. And, and that's an unlink, and it goes apart, and you can let the two circles die. The, the result of these moves is a surface in the abstract. One saddle point, two deaths gives me a genus zero surface. So I say that the virtual stevedore is not, is slice. It bounds a genus zero surface in virtual core space. I'll use that terminology, bounds a surface in core space. So you can check by doing the, remember I told you about working on the bracket by looking at all its loops in, uh, in a surface. In this case, I needed to do that to check that the virtual stevedore's knot is not a classical knot. It's genuinely a virtual knot. I won't do the details there. You can play with virtual mirror images and see that they are sliced. So here, for example, is this knot connected some with its virtual mirror image, and I go through a bunch of saddles and it falls apart, just like uh, happens in classical theory. Um, We'll say that one knot is concordant to the other if there exists a cobordism from one to the other of genus zero through saddles and maximum and through saddles and births and deaths. And of course, the virtual knot is said to be sliced if it's concordant to the unknot, as we did in the case of the virtual stevedore. Now comes the matter of spanning surfaces. And I'll try to bide my time. I just want to show you some basics. Um, in ordinary knot theory, classical knot theory, you can form a cyclic surface by taking the cyclic circles, oriented smoothings, and then putting little twists back at each crossing, right? There's your classical cyclic surface. What if you do this, try to do this for a virtual knot? Well, you can form the smoothings, but we don't have the disks anymore on a virtual knot, but I'm still on a classical knot. And I want to say this in another way. I do, I form the site, I form instead of forming ciphered smoothings, I do go through a saddle. I go through an oriented saddle at each, near each crossing. 
one in, one out. You go through an oriented saddle. It gives me the same circles as the ciphered circles in a classical case. But then I say to myself, ah, you went through a cobordism and now these are all unknotted and I bound them with disks and I have a surface in four space. And that surface in four space has the genus of the ciphered surface of the knot. And in fact, it is the ciphered surface of the classical knot pushed into the four bond. So we can do the same thing with a virtual knot. You go through the saddles and you get, in this case, only one ciphered circuit, but it's unknotted and you bound it with a disk and you find that you have a genus one surface in four space. And in general, the genus is one half of the number of ciphered circles minus the number of ciphered circles plus the number of crossings plus one. So you have a, a, a notion of the virtual cobordism ciphered surface. It gives you a surface that the knot bounds in virtual four space, and it is not usually the least genus surface that you can do by cobordism, by concordance. But here's the one we just made and how it became genus one. You went through one saddle and you got two circles and then you went through another saddle and you went back to one. So what we proved using virtual Kavana homology is that if you have a positive virtual knot, then the four ball genus is given by it, the genus of its virtual ciphered surface. And I'm not going to go through proof of that here certainly not in minus five minutes, right? But that's a nice theorem, and it generalizes Rasmussen's theorem and his invariant. And there's more to think about here, but this is a nice, nice theorem. Um, now, I'm going to skip some things because I just wanted to show you a little something. So I'll skip this part. Oh, this part I won't. This is just showing you how you can make lots of knots that have all odd crossings. You see, you can just make them up by making their Gauss diagrams so that they all have odd crossings, infinitely many of them. And those are lots and lots and lots of knots that are detectable by the parity bracket that we talked about in the first case. But then I wanted to talk about the affine index polynomial. And let me just indicate a couple of things about it in quick. So this is due to myself. It's also due to Allison Henrik with a different um, choice of uh, uh, choosing positive uh, but not negative exponents and Chang and Heather Dye in a different form and myself and Lena Fulwasny worked on a variant of it. Um, it's an idea that occurs to a lot of people. Uh, and it's a simple enough idea. The way I think, like to think about it is labeling the knot diagram itself. This corresponds to some people's labeling of the chord diagram. I like to label the knot diagram using the indicators that you see here. If you lay, put an integer down, and when you go through a crossing going to the left, it goes down. And when you go through a crossing going to the right, it goes up. So you start with a zero and label your knot diagram. And you can always label any knot diagram or virtual knot diagram. And then you get an index at every crossing, which is equal to the difference between the incoming arc and the outgoing arc. Now, I need to point, so I'll go back to here. The ingoing arc and the outgoing arc for plus are these top arcs, and the ingoing arc and the outgoing arc at the bottom are these arcs for minus. So at A, the, dif the difference W plus is 0 minus 2. Um, I'm sorry. Did I make a mistake here today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. I made a sign error from my point of view now anyway. I would call the W plus the one on the top and it would be minus two and the one on the bottom would be plus. So this should be W plus and W minus. But in any case, you assign to a, a crossing the uh, the difference plus if it's a plus crossing and the difference minus if it's a minus crossing. Let's look at another uh, example. All 
I wanted an example. Let's see if I have my conventions the way I want them here. Yes, I do. All right. So here you see that minus one minus one is plus, and that's the W plus. And if the crossing is a positive crossing, that would be the weight. And then you take the sum. Now, the definition of the polynomial is that it is the sum of the signs of the crossings times t to the weight of the crossing. Now, this weight that I'm assigning is actually um, understood also in the following way. Take a trip in the knot diagram, starting here and coming all the way back here. Let me find an easy trip here. You go start here and come all the way back to where you started. Yeah, that trip. Now you see that every time you go through a, a, a classical crossing, you go up or down. When you go through a virtual crossing, you don't change. And so if, if there are some virtual crossings in this trip, then it may be that you will get quite a big change here. It's more than just parity. Um, and uh, that change is what you're checking here. So it, in the chord diagram, it has to do with the intersection numbers of the chord for this with all the other chords. And you can quickly write down uh, the polynomial for any knot you like, because these are easy things to calculate. And you actually write down a chart which lets you get all of the exponential number of knots that correspond to a given diagram because of the choices that you make. This invariant, this invariant, never mind the details about doing it for links, uh, this invariant is a concordance invariant. This polynomial is a concordance invariant. And the basic reason for that is that when you go through a concordance, like in this picture, you end up with somebody who is wound around somebody else, but that somebody actually has a trivial polynomial, and all the contributions are going to cancel out. Uh, and then all you have to do is match the labelings at the place where the, uh, where, the, where the saddle point happens. I might have indicated that here. Um, you see here in this one, you have a zero labeling and a zero labeling, so you can go through the saddle point and get a labeling of this. And because this pulls out, it's a trivial component in the concordance, all the, all the contributions that come from this will cancel each other out. So that's basically the reason why this is a concordance invariant. But it's very interesting to have a simply computable concordance invariant of virtual knots. And I just wanted to show you some little example. Let's see. Yeah, this is a good example to end with. Here uh, is k plus and k. And um, what's the difference between them? It's late at night for me and early in the morning for you. And it's probably not easy to look at back and forth between these two and see that the only difference is this crossing. I switched that crossing, OK? Now, k plus is all positive crossing. So according to the theorem I quoted to you, this is non-trivially concordant um, because it's not, it's, it's not, uh, its genus, its genus is equal to its cipher genus. And it's quite non-trivial. Um, what will happen, and, um, and the, and the index polynomial tells me also that it's non-trivial, but doesn't yet tell me anything about the genus. On the other hand, here's k, and it has a trivial index, non-trivial index polynomial. So that tells me that k is not concordant to the trivial knot, is not sliced. And maybe we could figure out its genus, but we'd have to try to get a cobordism to compare with it. So we do. And in this case, I can go through a saddle here. And then I can go through another saddle. Where did I do it? Here. Um, and, then, uh, and then I have 
this line here goes from here to here, and I can go through a detour and just take it straight across, and then I see that I can pull in by a two move and and get rid of this, and it goes away. So what did I found? find? I found that I went through two saddles, and so it has genus one. One saddle takes me to two components, the other saddle takes me back to one component and it bounds a disc. So, so, um, so it does have genus, it does bound a torus, and so it must have genus one because its index polynomial was non-trivial. So in this case, this goes outside of the theorem using Rasmussen invariant, where this one had genus two, I think, but this one only has genus one, and um, and we can get in that crack with this other invariant. So, so that's an example of some of the sorts of things that you can do. Knot cobordism is notoriously hard in um, in classical knot theory, and it's still hard here. And there's lots and lots more to discover about knot cobordism. We're quite sure. And so this is just the beginning of putting some virtual invariants into the category of not cobordism so that we can think about it and try to get some results. So thank you for your attention. And I'm glad to have had the opportunity to give you a couple of talks on this subject. Um, someone asked, is there any result known for finding ranks of Kovana homology of alternating virtual knots? in terms of Jones polynomial and signature, as in the case of classical knots? That's a good question. And now that we have uh, the, um, now that we really have a good definition for the integral Kovana homology, I think we could, we could try to look at that. But I don't know the answer at this point. William Rushworth might know for his theory. It's a good question. Other questions? Yeah, I have one question. So, uh, do we retrieve uh, the zones polynomial for virtual knots from uh, this virtual covenant theory? Can you derive the Jones polynomial for virtual knots from the Kovano theory? Oh, yes, the same way, the same formula. It's the graded order characteristic of the uh, homology theory. Mm -hmm. Sahil Joshi says, suppose we have graphical vertices having degree four instead of virtual crossing. Is there a homology theory for the category of spatial graphs? Uh, yes, there are. Um, there's more than one choice of how you might do that. I'm not sure what the right reference is. Um, I'm, I have this nagging idea that one way, is, one way is obvious. You could resolve those graphical vertices into, into crossings uh, in some way and then take the Kovana homology. Uh, that will work. But, um, but there's another subtle idea that somebody had, which I'm not remembering right now. In any case, it's you certainly can do it. Any more questions or comments? Well, we did everything in two lectures, so uh, so it takes a while to figure out what the questions are when you when you survey too much, right? Uh, yes, Lie homology can be extended for virtual knots, and that's what I was saying. That that's what we did. We extended Lie homology, uh, and then used it to define a Rasmussen invariant. Is the notion of quasi alternating links extended to virtual knot theory? Let's see. What does quasi alternating mean? Um, what are, can you tell me what quasi-alternating means? Does it mean uh, that you have some stretches of overs? 
what is your definition of quasi alternate? Yeah, but, um, what is the definition of quasi alternating? Perhaps you can write that in the chat line. I'm a bad scholar. I don't know the definition of quasi alternating. <laughs> Uh, these are links which have uh, thin uh, uh, flower homology or Kovalev homology. Oh, That's I a see. Oh, oh, of I see. In other words, they they appear like uh, like alternating links in the homology, but you don't yeah. have a you don't have a uh, geometric definition of them. Yeah. Thank you. Um. And you're going across from one homology theory to the other. So, so this is at first it would be an interesting calculation, right? We could take the list of all the quasi alternating links that are quasi alternating because they have thin floor homology, and we could put them into our program once it gets running in an efficient way and see what happens to it over there. Uh, then maybe we get a conjecture. But is there a conjecture in the floor homology? Uh, world about what a quasi alternating link would be in terms of the structure of its diagram or something else about it. Maybe that's not known, but that, that certainly would be a natural question, wouldn't it? Thank you. Uh, is there any known table for virtual links up to some crossings? And what are some important invariants we can use to classify them? Okay, so um, on drawer on the drawer site, Jeremy Green's tables. I expect we should get better tables sometime in the next year or two, but those are the ones that we have now, and. I believe he lists um, some invariants as well. And the invariants that you want are, of course, the uh, bracket Jones. Um, the arrow Miyazawa. Right, those are the same. I'm just I'm noting that because we called it arrow and Miyazawa, it's called Miyazawa polynomial. Um, the index polynomial that I was just telling you about. Um, uh, then uh, um, mm, other, other invariants that I think are important are surface bracket, which is what I was indicating to you where you maybe you know that it virtual not on a minimal surface or you have a conjecture for a minimal surface and then you look at the isotopy classes of of curves in the state sum for the bracket and that gives you more information and surface arrow and let's see then there are algebraic invariants fundamental group Quandl, by Quandl, and then getting back to fundamental group, um, what should I call it? Strengthen fundamental group and Quandl. And the strengthening is by extra relation at. virtual crossing. And by adding an extra relation at the virtual crossing, you get a you get a much stronger uh, fundamental group, a kind of fundamental group. Um, mm, this is also studied by uh, Bardakov and uh, Misochinia, and uh, they uh, they do it uh, by using braid braid groups, virtual braid groups. Um, but um, but it's a very s nice simple idea. You have a virtual crossing, 
and you say, okay, I'm going to have an extra operator. And when a, when a label comes into the virtual crossing and goes out on the right, it gets quandal operated on by that operator. And when it goes to the left, it gets inverse quandal operated on by that operator. And then you see that it's still invariant under everything, but you have a, you have, you have reflected much more structure into that. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, and then, of course, the link homologies. And then um, if you're doing rotational, virtual, then you have lots of quantum invariance. Because rotational virtuals, which don't allow you to use the first curl, curl which I talked about last time, the end of quantum invariance work. We didn't talk about quantum invariance. Uh, hmm. uh, no time to talk about quantum invariance. Well, another time and another talk, right? Um, but that means you have the Homfle polynomial, and you have lots of things. Um, another polynomial that's important, in my opinion, is the Sawalik. Which is a kind of um, generalized Alexander poly. Very interesting and very. I, I misspelled Sawalik. Yeah. Um, I probably missed a few. Uh, invariants, those are, um, oh, well, I did, didn't I? There's the parity, uh, parity bracket and relatives. And um, some of those relatives are somewhat quantum invariants, like the uh, Turayev, uh, the Turayev uh, bracket. Can be done for virtual, so I keep misspelling. To write, yeah. Um, the thing, the thing is that you know any invariant of classical knots um, has a good chance of having something working for it in the virtual domain, one way or another. There is one question from Amarendra Singh Ji, uh, if you can see, uh, does span of zones polynomial in virtual knot act as lower bounds in classical knot on minimal crossing number? Uh, yeah, um, but I don't have the exact result in my mind right now. So yeah, the answer is yes, but I'm not going to try to write down the exact relation. Same argument. One question from Kirandi: Is it possible to extend assigned labeling to spatial graphs? Um, where, where's the question? Oh, extend the affine labeling to spatial graphs. Is that the question? The question: Is it possible to extend the affine labeling to spatial graphs? Is that the one you were referring to? Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Um. Let me think about that for a moment. Uh, you see, the answer is yes, but I don't know if you had in mind to do it the way I would do it. Let me show you what I had in mind if you, if you have the patience to listen to me for a moment. Uh, or maybe I just say it. Let me say it. If you're looking for invariance of spatial graphs, you can, uh, and it's rigid vertex spatial graphs that you're talking about, 
then you can always make a choice about resolving the graphical vertex into some tangles. For example, maybe into an overcrossing and an undercrossing and a smoothing. Um, but you make a choice and resolve it into tangles. And you say, there's an expansion formula. It'll be A times the upper plus B times the lower plus C times the smoothing. You expand it. And then you say, the invariant of the spatial graph will be the sum of these cl of some classical invariant applied to all these classical knots and links that I derived from the spatial graph. At that point, if you had virtual spatial graphs, you could have an invariant of them, which was a certain sum of invariants of virtual knots and links. And then you could do affine labeling on them. Uh, and indeed, you would you would have a number of very interesting invariants for spatial graphs that would come out of that that I, I haven't looked at. Every time this comes up and uh, we get serious about it, we write another small paper about some variant of this because there are so many variants. It's amusing. Um, there, probably there's a problem here about what's the best way to take that idea and make the largest formulation of it. Is there a Homfle polynomial for virtual links and a link homology that categorifies the Homfle polynomial for virtual links? Uh, there is a uh, that that follows from the same thing I was telling you before that you can do quantum invariance for rotations. On the other hand, uh, hmm. What happens to uh, a categorification of that? I don't know. But there's another piece of this, uh, the question that you asked. The Kovana Rosansky cat for. Um, works for virtuals, but uh, that's supposed to be Kovano there, not Cole. But uh, but we don't know what the corresponding polys are for virtual knots. I avoided that in the first time I answered your question, but I have to say it, right? The, the theory, the Kovano for Lozansky categorification theory for the Homflip polynomial extends to virtuals. They prove it. But, but then you would like to somehow pull it back and, uh, and get the corresponding graded Euler characteristic polynomial for virtuals that it's implying. And we don't know anything about that, or at least I don't. But maybe progress has been made behind, uh, behind my knowledge. I, I don't know. But the last time I looked, we knew nothing about it. So, so we try to construct things from the ground up. But, but sometimes there are things that come from the higher structures down that we don't understand at all, like that. I have one question. Mm -hmm. There seems no unique definition of a group of a virtual knot. It depends on the various representations that people have constructed, like Baldago and IP. I'm sorry, there's a bit of distortion in the, in the sound. Could you write your question like the others? I, it'll help me. There is. Um, or at least the combinatorial topological definition. It is the following. Um, you can represent your virtual knot in a surface cross I. All right, so it's embedded in a surface cross I. It's a surface cross I. So you have the lower surface, call it F0, and the upper surface, call it F1. 
Take the cone on F1. Now you have a three-dimensional space with a singularity, right? Um, and the knot is embedded in that space. At the bottom of the space, it looks like the surface cross line and a crunch. The fundamental group, the, the Vertinger presentation fundamental group of the virtual knot is the fundamental group of that knot in that cone space. All right, so one related question. So uh -huh. Is there a representation that will realize that group? Can but that's what, I, that's what I just said. The fundamental group of the complement of the knot embedded in that cone space is, yeah. is the Vertinger presentation fundamental group for the virtual knot. Yeah, so uh, can we find a representation of all right, yeah. So, can we realize this group by representation of the virtual braid group into symmetries of some other group, just like we have in the classical art in the classical art theory? Oh, you want to represent the fundamental group as in terms of the braid group somehow. Yes. Well, I think you can probably do that. You can write the Rudinger presentation. If you represent the virtual knot as a virtual braid, closure, um, then, um, then it's an, you have an element in the virtual braid group. And you look at how that, that braid acts on the generators. And then the group is, is presented as the action on those generators is equal to the original set of generators, right? There's an automorphism there. And that gives you the Verdinger presentation. Uh, is there any reference for uh, the definition of our group? Mm, I don't have a reference for that. But I think that's what you mean, right? In the classical case, if you're going to present the fundamental group in terms of the braid group, then you think of the braid as an operator on the free group. Um, and it gives you an automorphism of the free group. And you set that automorphism of those free group elements into back equal to the original elements, right? That's the standard classical way of writing fundamental group in terms of the braid group. I thought that's what you were referring to. No, well, I, I was referring to your cone construction uh, that the geometric answer to this. Maybe you write down the the name of what it is you're thinking of. Um, uh, that's the de geometric definition I know. Now, what did um, Professor Kamada have in mind? Say, Ichi, what did you have in mind as an answer to his question? Hmm? What, what kind of an answer did you have in mind? Did you have in mind the answer that I gave or something different? No, no, the same one. This ah, one oh. is proved in our paper first. Oh, oh I see. Yes. All right. yeah. Yeah. Of course, it's upper presentation. For the upper presentation, virtual Yes, that's, that's right. Our yeah. lower presentation is the opposite side. Yes, yes. That is written in our paper, now coined my mm, Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, there seems no more question. So let us thank Professor Kaufman for wonderful lectures and addressing our questions for patients. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you.